Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from Investor Stream and I'll be your host this morning. Today we have Kalina Power Limited Managing Director Ross McLaughlin who's going to provide us with an operational update on the company's Alberta projects. Following the presentation, Ross will address any questions you may have. We'll attempt to get through as many questions as time permits. We've had quite the influx of questions prior to the webinar, but feel free to keep sending them through um, via the chat platform in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel, or as many of you have done already, you can email them to me at alex at investorstream.com.au. Like I said, we're gonna to attempt to get through as many questions as time permits. Uh, we have an hour up our sleeves, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. You can also download a copy of the web of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. A copy of the webinar will be, will be available on the Kalina Power website later today. But for now, I'd like to throw it over to Ross, who's going to get us underway. Ross, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And uh, it's nice to be able to talk with a, a broader audience like this. And uh, hopefully this will be the first of many such webinars that we'll be able to hold in order to communicate with our investors and some of the new investors that want to know more about our story and our progress. Um, I note very uh, clearly that there's a number of uh, investors who have registered for this uh, for this webinar who've probably heard the story several times and, and, and followed our progress very closely. And I hope you'll be patient with me as I walk through what will appear to be some information that you've seen before, and hopefully you'll identify some of the new information which I'd like to cover, and certainly welcome the involvement and participation of many of the new investors who are probably hearing the story for the first time. So bear with me, I'd like to be able to make sure I cover both audiences as effectively as we can. Um, quite clearly, uh, we're very excited about we're, what we're doing, and uh, we think uh, as we walk through this uh, 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 this presentation, uh, we hope that you're going to take away from this a sense of commitment to a strategy which we're completely behind and completely committed to, which we believe is going to be really tr quite transformative for the company. You know, timing is everything, and this really is a compelling ESG investment opportunity, and in the particular sector of waste heat to power. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're also going to talk a lot about what we're doing in the foundational stages of getting our company to a point of profitability and sustainability with the uh, efforts that were underway in Alberta. Um, you've probably all noticed that in, in recent months we've completed a couple of financings uh, which have put ourselves in a pretty good position. You've seen our, our, uh, the chart on our sales, or sorry, on our, uh, on our share price. And you've also seen a little bit of a change in the um, in the uh, makeup of our of our shareholder group. I would say that our shareholder uh, distribution and our shareholder um, uh, participation is probably much stronger than it's ever been in the past. Uh, the the this, the uh, diversity of the shareholder group is much stronger than we've had in previous years, where a, lo a lot of reliance, frankly, was always held on just one or two key investors in the company. We've managed with the help of, uh, of uh, a lot of people participating in, our, in, in, in helping us get through this to put ourselves in a position where we actually now have, I think, a pretty broad and diverse shareholder group, um, which we're feeling very strong about. When we talk about investment highlights, I think uh, the fact that we have a zero emissions technology in a world today that's looking for solutions is fantastic. I mean, you can... You know, for those of us that have been around the the, uh, the renewable energy sector for many years, uh, there's a great definition about being a pioneer in any sector, and in particular this one, and that's uh, someone described with a bunch of arrows in their back. If you get too far ahead of the market, often you're in trouble. And I think what we can see is that we have a, a great a great amount of history on this technology and this industry, waste heat to power, that has been going on now for 10 to 15 years. And perhaps it was ahead of its time, perhaps it was ahead of its market, but right now, the market seems to be ideally suited for technologies such as ours. You can see right now when we're talking about this, this waste heat to power market, um, the US Department of Energy commissioned a, a study a few years back with Oak Ridge National Labs, which basically said the, the, the market just in the US alone is like $38 billion. Uh, that's a massive market for a small company like ourselves to go after. And of course, it's dominated by this incumbent technology leader, uh, Organic Rankin Cycle. Uh, that's the technology which was which was commercialized by Ormat. They didn't maintain their 
their, their patent portfolio as, as strongly as they could have, and others are participating in the space. It is a growing market, and Ormat, of course, is uh, embodies that success uh, as a company with a market cap today of over $3.7 billion. In order to go after a market like that and be, I think, really viewed seriously, it's important that you have a great team of people that understand the industry. Understand the industry, but also understand technology commercialization. And uh, as we'll see in a moment, and many of you know, we, we've got, got an amazing team, a, an amazing bench uh, of, uh, of, uh, of board members and of uh, our management team who are well-versed and well-recognized um, as leaders in this industry. Um, and in particular, of course, our North American team, where we're developing multiple power projects that are going to be using the Kalina cycle. We're going to get to that in a moment. I think a great technology is one thing. Uh, being well-funded is quite another. But at the end of the day, you need to have uh, an effective business model. And that has to be a business model that can create value and drive growth. And you we're going to hear more about this, but implementing our own business, build and own and operate model that has attractive margins, and we'll only do this in select North American locations, is the foundational piece of our business in which we've made this major change over the last 18 months to two years. And it's really not a new model. It's a model that we've actually copied from Ormat, $3.7 billion market leader. It's a business model which have been, has been used by other companies quite successfully. Members of the company that I was, used to be involved with and members of our team used to be involved with called Pristine Power, where we can go out and build, own, and operate projects which have sufficient margin that allow us to attract infrastructure funding and allow us to maintain or, or, can, or have an ongoing equity interest in these projects. We'll talk about that in a minute. At the same time, you need to have, if you're really looking to be a worldwide player, an effective international licensing program. And while we are still looking at licensing opportunities around the globe, we also know that we need to focus on having a, a foundational business, a profitable business uh, uh, behind us. And that's really what we're doing right now. I'm very happy to report, and I mentioned this in our letter to our shareholders for uh, recently, we now have the funding in place to deliver our initial projects in Alberta and become cash flow positive in 2021. So let's talk for a few minutes about this opportunity in the global waste heat to power market. Waste heat to power, WHP, is in fact a, uh, an acronym for this entire sector because it's a massive sector that's, that, that involves industrial waste heat, even geothermal waste heat that's not being properly utilized to convert that into power. And our job and our goal is to establish a profitable business in Alberta and that can serve as a platform for us to then go after international markets effectively and become a major player. In the past, going after it piecemeal has not been successful, and going after it with not without a without a financial foundation has not been successful. Our job right now is to have a find, found financial foundation with which we can then properly deploy and properly go after international markets. So what does waste to heat to power these technologies in the sector do? Very simply, these bullet points kind of summarize it for you, but if I, if I can, just understand that if you were imagining a steel mill or a, a, an industrial facility like a cement plant, a petrochemical facility, these, these are massively energy intensive industries. And the processes that they employ to produce their primary products produce an awful lot of excess waste heat. That waste heat literally is, just goes to the atmosphere. It isn't necessarily doesn't contain carbon. There's a lot of carbon emissions associated with the energy that was required for their process. But this literally goes to the atmosphere. It's wasted heat, it's not waste heat from a municipal dump or something. This is wasted heat from an industrial process. And often it's not hot enough to boil water that you could use for a conventional steam cycle to generate electricity. But the waste heat is often sufficient enough to boil something else. And we call this in our industry a working fluid. And working fluids that have a lower temperature, lower temperature than water, can be used in a closed loop system, boil that working fluid, create a vapor similar to steam, and drive a turbine that generates electricity. That's really what waste to heat to power technologies do. And this sector, it, it consists of power uh, producers and energy intensive industries 
that are also looking to reduce their carbon footprint. And we already mentioned the size of the market in the United States alone. Organic Rankin Cycle is now an incumbent technology that's prevalent throughout the world. So if you think I'm talking about a technology, waste heat to power technologies that are in their nascent development stages, please, please uh, correct yourself. Organic Rankin Cycle technologies are deployed in almost every country on the planet, particularly countries with a energy intensive economy. So they're already there. And of course, as we mentioned, the market leader, of course, is, is Ormap. Now, there are several other companies, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, Ormat did not maintain its patent position as strongly as it could have, but there are other companies that now compete against Ormat with their own unique variations of organic Rankin cycle. When we contrast that to the Kalina cycle, we come to understand that the Kalina cycle does represent significant improvements to ORC that have performance advantages. And sometimes those advantages are narrow. Sometimes those are only five to 10% more efficient, but often we're more capital cost efficient. And in some cases, our performances can be up to 40% more efficient in creating power. The one great thing as shareholders, common shareholders today, being involved with Kalina, we can look at a track record that shows that it has been successfully deployed not only in geothermal projects, but also industrial sectors such as the steel industry, cement industry, and with petrochemical plants in the power industry. We can look to that track record and build on that success. There's a slide here. I'm not gonna get into all the details. I'll leave it with you. But if you have not seen the, or the, uh, the Kalina cycle in action or wanted to see how it really worked, I can assure you that a much better way of describing it can be found in a brief, very brief, seven minute video. There's a link here. There's a picture of the, of the Kalina cycle technology in operation in Germany. There's a link to that seven minutes of your time will really describe how it works and perhaps offer some of the competitive advantages. But the, the table on the left just illustrates that organic Rankine cycle uses a fixed concentration of a working fluid, such as pentane, butane, or some other refrigerant, whereas the Kalina cycle, because ammonia and water have a common, not, sim, not, exactly, not exactly the same, but a common or very similar molecular weight, it allows us to adjust the concentrations of ammonia and water and thereby vary and alter the boiling temperature of the working fluid. And that offers tremendous performance efficiencies, particularly in the power market. There are environmental advantages using ammonia water over organic rec and cycle working fluids, and they're listed there, okay? So there's, there's a definite opportunity for us in terms of how we compete against ORC and the competitive advantages that Kalina cycle represents. I mentioned to you earlier about a team. Um, I, 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 in the interest of time, I'm just hoping that many of you will take the time to review the brief bios on the folks that have joined and been involved and are now representative as our, as, our, as, our, as our board members and also our senior executives on the team. There's something quite interesting in common with the vast majority of everybody that is there. At one time or another in their careers, either recently, in the last five or six years, or previously over the last 15 to 20, each and every one of those individuals has had exposure or even experience with the Kalina cycle, or even Dr. Alexander Kalina himself. And it's because of that, that when they recognize the opportunity of what we're doing at Kalina Power, that's why they wanted to get involved. They recognize this is more than us just building two or three plants, let alone two or three plants in Alberta. It's really about a much bigger story. And that's why the caliber of this group, uh, and it's an incredible team, and just an amazing team. And these aren't all the individuals. There's individuals behind us and our management team and our operational team. Again, every one of them has had some exposure with Kalina. And that's what makes it really pretty exciting to see the level of commitment of this kind of a group of people to be so committed to what we're doing. Often people ask me, and I, and what, I think you've all known that for, I guess it was about a year ago, Jeff Myers and I spent about four to six months with many, many trips to New York, Toronto, and everywhere else, talking about our new business model with the Kalina cycle. And we got a lot of interest in this. And uh, one common question that kept coming up all the time was, 
why on earth are you working? Why on earth are you focusing on Alberta? There's much, much bigger markets than Alberta. Well, frankly, there's really two answers to that. One, which is just the common sense answer, is that's where our team is. And our team really does understand the Alberta market, the Western Canadian market, the power industry market in North America generally, but they happen to most of them live in Calgary. So that's one of the one of the reasons why we're there. The second reason is because this massive legislated retirement, this is not some announced plan to, to, to retire. This has been legislated that they're going to retire 5.7 gigawatts of base load coal fire power in the province of Alberta. And the uncertainty associated with that announcement and a plan from a semi left wing government um, created a great deal of anxiety in the province. And this has been legislated. The new conservative government that has stepped in has not backed down from that commitment. That's one of the great policy directives that we're seeing here and one of the nice trends that we're seeing in Alberta. And in fact, federally, even in Canada, we're seeing a real move to, of course, reducing the carbon footprint of a, particularly Alberta, which is our energy economy for the, for the country, which has a significant carbon footprint. And there is a great move afoot to see this carried through retiring 5.7 gigawatts of base, base load power from coal and replace it with obviously more energy uh, efficient, but but uh, carbon efficient uh, means of power. Um, so not only is our team there, and we've also uh, brought on a new general manager who uh, who uh, um, used to be with uh, NMAX, which is one of the major utilities in the province, and five of our former um, uh, team members from Pristine Power, uh, which was one of our fastest growing independent power producers in Canada. I was on the board with Jeff Myers, and that was a great company until we sold it. Uh, but they're all on board out of Calgary. We understand the market very, very well, and we're really excited to be doing what we're doing in, in Alberta. When we look at a company like ourselves, we contrast ourselves, obviously, to a massive company like Ormat and other players that want to play in this space. How do we do that effectively and efficiently? And, you know, to go out there and hire, what, 100, 100 uh, engineers to be able to do all of our projects, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So what we have done is we have decided to modularize our packages of the Kalina cycle. Now, this might come as a surprise to many of you who followed the story for a while, but it's very important for you to know. And this is one of the, one of the, I'll call it one of the mistakes, but one of the blessings that we have from what has happened in the past. There are essentially seven different variations or variants of the Kalina cycle, depending on the application in the industry. And frankly, what's been great is about five of those have already been built by Kalina in various iterations around the planet. We need to have a, a, a engineering partner who can modularize and package each of those variations of the Kalina cycle in a cost-effective way in a modularized form so they can be delivered to the site, delivered to a customer, and just installed. In the past, what would happen is we would customize a project, we would customize an application of the Kalina cycle for each and every variation. And that is extremely expensive and not very effective. This way, what we can do is answer what the customers want. They just simply want to have a ways to heat to power solution. And by having a, a partner like Interflex associated with us, enables us to be able to deliver that. And that's why we teamed up with Interflex. Power Engineers, not a household name, but ranked fourth or fifth in the world, depending on the year, in the power sector by Engineering News Record, every year. Power Engineers, just so you know, has built more organic Rankin Cycle plants in the world than any other company other than Ormat. They built them on behalf of these other technology solutions and technology providers wanting to use organic rank and cycle. They've also been involved with Kalina projects, about three or four of them in the past, and on multiple uh, and on multiple presentations and, uh, and proposals that we've done. They're on our team as our owner's engineer and chief process design reviewer. So we really now have, without having to hire a lot of people on board, we have two arms, if you will, of the engineering and on the manufacturing side on our team. And of course, a big piece of this is going to be with our business model. If we're going to build, own, and operate our plants and not raise money at the Kalina power level and dilute our shareholders, where are we going to get this money from? And of course, the answer to that is do exactly what Ormat did, also what Pristine Power did. 
which is to do off-balance sheet financing of each of these projects, bringing infrastructure funding in. And we've done that with our agreement with Akira Partners out of Calgary. This slide number 10 um, uh, looks like an awful lot of lines and a lot of arrows. That's the best way we've been able to come up with so far to be able to show how the cash flows of all of this work. But at the end of the day, what's important to understand is that each project will probably end up be, well, not probably, will end up becoming a limited partnership of each distinct project owned by, owned by um, uh, uh, Akira and ourselves uh, in proportional um, uh, uh, ownership levels. And what is essential for us in terms of what we have negotiated with Akira, we're gonna get into these numbers in a, in a minute later on in the presentation, but what's essential is to understand that we, our job, our job at Kalina Power with our subsidiary in, in Canada called Kalina Distributor Power, our job is to develop the projects. Akira's job is not to come and help us with the development funding of these projects, that's our job, and we are now well-funded to complete that. Our job is to develop the projects to the point where everything is contracted and ready to go, and Akira's job Akira's job is to provide the equity that goes into each of those projects and to arrange the debt for each of those projects. In return, what we get is we get reimbursed our expenses that we incur to develop those projects, because we've been developing them at risk, plus we get a 4% development fee, and we get ongoing royalties, and we'll end up with a share of the returns on the project that exceed Akira's threshold returns. We'll talk about that in a second because I know many of you have asked those questions. That's how the cash flows work, essentially. Now on slide 11, um, and please take the time to look at this slide for a sec because some questions which have come in uh, appear not to perhaps have focused on this. Um, and this slide was carefully chosen, believe it or not, because of one of the problems we ran into in Australia last year when we came out with an announcement that talked about our projected returns from these projects. And properly so, probably, I guess, in, in retrospect, the exchange has rules against that. And they asked us to retract that. We had to retract whatever we filed. And we were, per, we were restricted from filing anything more because the rules essentially in the Australian uh, market require that you, you have to have your um, uh, revenues contracted before you start projecting what they can be. Now, how is it that we're able to therefore predict uh, and, and project these revenues? Well, these are the revenues that we've actually got in an agreement with Akira. Our agreement with Akira calls for this. That's not projection. What is not able to project is what the returns from each of these projects will be. We believe we know what they are, and Akira understands what they expect them to be, and we're all working towards getting all that done, so it's all wrapped up for time to go ahead and build our plants. But the reality is until they're all sewn up and all done, we cannot, according to the rules of the exchange, project what those are. But even if we just as shareholders, and I'm a significant shareholder in the company, and I hope you'll go along with me on this because this is important, we have a market cap today collectively of around $30 million, which we think is uh, you know, a, a very good value. But the reality is, if all we do is just do what we contract for with Akira, and that is to get reimbursed our expenses at full notice to proceed, and get paid a development fee, half at full notice to proceed and half once the, the, the projects are constructed, if that's all we do, and then get our ongoing royalties, if we never received a dime out of, the, out, of, out, of the, out of our share of the future returns, we're on our way to having a cash sustainable business that is a profitable business. And I can assure you, I can absolutely assure you, we are not doing it just to be able to do that. We are doing that because we do expect and call for our share of the returns which exceed Akira's threshold rates of return. Unfortunately, we're just not able to explain that level of detail to each of you. But that gives you an outline as to how the components are made up and what constitutes how we'll go forward and develop a business which is cash flow sustainable. And with that, with that that's our, our last slide. And of course, everyone can contact Tim uh, Horgan, our executive director, who's uh, in the Melbourne office, 
there is contact details uh, for follow up after this uh, after this presentation. Alex, over to you. Thanks, Ross. Uh, we have had a number of questions come through on your financial partner, Akira Partners, and you, you dealt with them quite extensively there. But how well known are they? And if the Alberta project development proceeds as you expect, how confident are you of their ability to provide debt and equity? Sure, and, and, and I wanna make a point here because I, I, I often heard people refer to this. They don't provide the debt and equity. They provide the equity on the projects and they arrange the debt. Now let's make this point because it's a distinction if we can. They're not in business to provide, you know, really discounted rates of uh, funding. They're trying to get the best returns they can for their fund. And what they wanted to do and why they're attracted to this is they're confident that they can get significant amounts of debt from conventional sources such as banks and other institutional lenders in the province of Alberta to lend to the project. That's important because that would come in at uh, interest rates which are uh, 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 competitive, for lack of a better word, and in a declining interest rate market, that's important to have. So they're convinced that we they can arrange project level debt for these projects, and they are going to provide the equity. Now, Akira Partners is a rebranded name of a new segment of funds out of the Grafton, G-R-A-F-T-O-N, Grafton funds which are in Calgary. Grafton Fund, set up by, by Rick Grafton out of Calgary, has been one of the more successful infrastructure funders in the energy sector, uh, uh, oil and gas, etc., in the province of Alberta. And about, I guess now two years ago, they identified that the ESG opportunity is something that they were going to miss out on unless they decided to come up with something different, either change the Grafton Fund mandate or create a new fund. And they chose to create a new fund with the principals and many of the key shareholders that fund Grafton funds and create this new fund called Akira. Um, I think they've got a great track record. and They're really regarded as one of the top funds in the, in the, uh, in the province. Uh, they're well connected, not only politically, but within every, uh, well, with, with the, with, the, uh, with every, almost every institution that's in, in Calgary and the president of their funds uh, is, serves on the board of directors of the University of Calgary. It's a, it's a very, they are a very, very well established and reputable fund um, and well known to uh, members of our team. So just on that, Ross, can you give us a flavor for the debt terms that Akira is proposing? Look, I understand you can't be specific, but I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in the parameters in terms of the cost of such money, especially in this very low interest rate environment. Exactly. So as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, they are they are confident they can arrange the debt funding. OK, they're, they're comfortable. They can arrange that debt funding. They don't provide the debt funding. They'll arrange it just like a lot of their projects that they do. Right. Whether it's uh, with, at Grafton funds, Grafton, what they do is they do an infrastructure fund. They put in the equity and they've arranged the debt. So the debt that is to, the debt when we started these projects that was expected to be coming from the institutions in Calgary and other places, the banks, et cetera, we originally were thinking that that was going to be at an interest rate somewhere in the range of around 6%. I think that number is going to be probably, well, let's put it this way. We, we model it today at five, but I have a feeling it will be less than 5% for the debt portion, for the debt portion. The returns though that Akira wished to have this is important. The returns that Akira wishes to have are frankly risk-adjusted rates of return. So for example, if we contract on a tolling deal where we're tolling a, a gas producer's gas on a 20-year contract through one of our plants, and it happens to be a, you know, an A-grade counterparty risk because it's just a phenomenal company, then the risk-adjusted returns that Akira is looking for are going to be much less but so is the, inter the, the, not the interest rate, but so is the rate or the tolling charge that we're gonna charge that counterparty because we, we, we have confidence in that. On the other hand, the, the tolling rate we might charge for a less, uh, a less strong counterparty um, will also carry with it higher returns that Akira will be looking for. That establishes their risk adjusted rate of return. I don't think any serious investor would expect me to, to uh, convey to them what Akira's expected rates of return are, because frankly, that's their business. 
and it's quite confidential to them in order for them to do the various deals that they do. We're not the only company they're dealing with. So that's very confidential to them. What is their expected rate of return, their threshold rate of return? Frankly, it varies depending on each how each deal is contracted, but frankly, also it's very confidential to them. Thanks, Ross. Your recent announcements have signaled, uh, albeit cautiously, expected transformative, transformative events. Now, so far, it has been hard to get an idea of the earning potential and trying to ascertain value of future projects for the company. Can you give a range of ongoing revenue that can be expected from a fully funded 30 megawatt project in Alberta, given cost savings that seem to be occurring? Well, this is something I was mentioning earlier in the presentation, and I and I and I know it's got to be difficult for uh, it's, it's difficult for us because I mean I would like to be able to share with everybody on an ongoing basis uh, how 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 each of these deals will turn out for us. What I cannot do, however, is 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 is, is uh, go against the rules of the exchange and publicly discuss projections which have not yet been contracted. And that was the problem that we got into. And for those that have been following our story for a while, they will recall that in September of 2019, we tried to do exactly that. And when we did, we were asked to retract everything. So I'm just not in a position to be able to say what those projected returns are. But I can say, and I will emphasize this again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, we have a, we have a market cap of $30 million today and with a massively huge opportunity in front of us. And if all we did was get the funds which are obligated to be paid to us under the current contract that we have with Akira, which is a reimbursement of our expenses, which is like you know three and a half four million dollars per project, and a four percent development fee. Again, you know that's a significant and our ongoing royalties. That's a significant amount of money for a company today with a market cap of only thirty million dollars. Trust me, there are additional funds which are there for us after they've received their rates of return, their threshold rates of return. But beyond that, I'm just not in a position to be able to share that. That's okay, Ross. Can you just high level the financials for me on the first plant? I can see KPO earns a royalty per year, mm -hmm. but I'm just struggling to, to understand the total picture in terms of the other earnings channels for KPO. Can you provide a little bit more clarity around the numbers that you've, re you've referenced on slide 11? Yeah, so let's go back to slide 11. I've got it up on my screen right now. If we just walk through these initial payments, this is the major la last bullet point there, the initial payments to Kalina, and that's why it's bolded. It says excluding our future waterfall returns. So I've had some questions about what does waterfall returns mean? And of course, if you Google it, it'll see exactly what it means. It talks about the rates of return in private equity that exceed or come after the threshold rates of return have been received, okay? So excluding excluding the waterfall returns, you can see how much money we're gonna be making, right? Because we know this is contracted with Acura. We're making at least $300,000 per year from our royalties. We're getting reimbursed our expenses, okay, of about four and a half million dollars. And we're gonna get about $6 million, $3 million at FNTP and $3 million at COD. And it cascades going forward on projects thereafter as, as is outlined there. So again, that's not why we're in business to go after reimbursement of expenses and just get a 4% development fee. But if that's all we got, plus our royalties, if that's all we had, and I'm not saying that's all we're gonna get, that's the reason why we're putting this up front is because that's the way that we develop a cash flow sustainable business and we don't have to raise more money for the Alberta program. During the, the slide presentation, uh, Ross, you referenced the company, uh, specifically uh, yourself and Jeffrey, uh, held a lot of meetings in New York with various project equity funders um, before you appointed Akira as your financial finance partner for initial projects in Canada. Are the funds you met with in New York still interested in providing funding? And if so, what jurisdic jurisdictions might you target and when? It's interesting. That's a very interesting question because um, – the amount of business that we have projected that we think we can go after in just Alberta alone, it's possible it could ex it's possible that it could exceed the funding capability of Akira. We don't know that, but it's possible. Um, we're quite confident that we can get five or seven or eight projects done with Akira, but we're looking at a lot more projects than just that, just in Alberta alone. So it was very important 
after we made the selection to go forward with Akira, that we've maintained contact with several of the better ones that we identified, the ones which we were very close to wanting to do business with us. We had several term sheets, as you may know. And it's important that they are still there and available to not only look at the projects in Alberta, but also look at projects which are also elsewhere in North America and in, even in, indeed internationally in certain select markets. So I, all I can tell you is this, is that we are actively continuing to maintain those relationships. And of course, they're looking very closely at all the things and the milestones that we're completing right now in Alberta, including the modularization and cost con containment that we're looking at with respect to our projects being modularized with Interflex and the work that we're doing with power engineers. So they'll, they're, there's several that want to see those numbers uh, because they are looking at continue, they, you know, they all have a need to place their, 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 their investment dollars uh, on, on good projects. And the fact that we had term sheets from several of them just suggested it's prudent for us to continue to maintain those relationships and look at other project opportunities when we're ready. Uh, on slide, on, I think it's slide nine, you referenced your strategic partnerships with Eneflex and Power Engineers. Can you just sort of readdress how confident your team and these service providers, how confident your team is with these service providers to provide, uh, to deliver the Alberta project successfully? Sure, I'm gonna, I'll answer that question slightly in reverse because it's Power Engineers that I think is the, was the, what were the ones that we were, we've been working closely with them for a number of years uh, and always looking at an opportunity to do something substantial with them given their stature and given the fact that they've built more organic rank and cycle plants than anyone other than ORMAT in the world. So we under, they have an understanding, we have an understanding of what our economics need to be, what our capital costs need to be, what our strategic and competitive advantages are from a technology point of view, et cetera. And they have been instrumental with us through not only our process reviews, but also in the selection of the key vendors of equipment, major equipment, et cetera, from around the globe. And they are continuing to play a very critical and pivotal role in it. So there's no question that we have one of the best, best owner engineer partners that we could possibly get. There's just nobody that's even close to being as, as, as qualified as power engineers. As part of that process, we needed to pick what we call our EPC partners, the people that can build, modularize, install, and get these projects deployed, and specifically in Alberta, and then hopefully elsewhere. And um, a lot of companies could, could do a third of that, half of that, in some cases, 80% of that, but only a handful of companies were capable of doing everything from soup to nuts, and that's what Interflex does. Interflex has a major facility for all this modularization uh, and fabrication in Calgary. They also have a similar size, actually larger size operation out of Houston. And interestingly enough, they compete around the globe on energy projects with facilities out of Houston and throughout North America with their facilities out of Calgary. Again, uh, the, we're just really, really fortunate to have them involved. I should point out if I could, the CEO of uh, Interflex had been trying about 10, 12 years ago to do a deal with, uh, actually this is going back 15 years ago, to try and do a deal with the Kalina cycle and just found he couldn't get the deal done because you know, he just couldn't get the deal done. And so when he heard his team was competing on this business, he picked up the phone, contacted his team and said, you get this deal done. And they gave us a terrific proposal we're really attractive, attracted to that motivation that they had, their keen interest, their commitment, and they've been just fantastic thus far. Uh, and they're really, really dedicated. They understand not only the opportunity for themselves in Alberta, they understand the opportunity for themselves in North America and internationally. Ross, well, your, your deck references the regulatory environment in Alberta being favorable to Kalina's type of project. Can you provide a little bit more context on the regulatory environment and what are the major risks, irrespective of uh, of the, the the favorable environment that you that you mentioned? Yeah, I, I think perhaps my this is a bit of my bias, maybe showing through when we when we when we put that into the slide deck. But I will tell you that previously we'd had a left of center uh, government uh, with the New De Democratic Party in 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 the province uh, uh, of Alberta. And they had a lot of progressive ideas that just weren't as commercially 
acceptable. And and when the right wing government came in with a rather really strong right leaning uh, party with the conservative party, new conservative party coming into Alberta, um, the concern for us in the industry was going to be whether or not they were going to be uh, adopting many of these progressive policies and just how they would react to it. And frankly, I think many of us in the business have been really pleasantly surprised to the fact they are not fighting this. In fact, they're actually encouraging it. And there were some regulatory issues which were somewhat barriers for, let's call it smaller power generators uh, in favor of the big utilities. Uh, there, we've seen some real significant movement on behalf of the new government to make that regulatory environment much, much easier, faster for small uh, 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 project developers to bring projects such as ours on, on stream quickly uh, under uh, less onerous uh, conditions than otherwise would have been the case. And perhaps the most significant has been an acceptance of, uh, of climate change, an acceptance of the need to lower the carbon footprint of the province. And that has been dovetailed with the major moves by the federal government in that regard. So I think all in all, while we had some trepidation and some concerns, um, we're really comfortable with what we see. Thanks, Ross. Uh, just how, in, how can investors be confident that the company is now on track to meet its final notice to proceed target of March 21, 2021? Um, are you planning to publish the schedule um, beyond that? And when when is it expected? Well, I mean, um, I guess before we talk about the schedule beyond that, we have to talk about the schedule to get there. And the schedule to get there really just consists of a number of things which have to be done. We have a lot of contracting of the various components with the interconnection with the electricity, the interconnection with the gas, site control of various sites, uh, terms for offtake or tolling agreements that we're negotiating right now. And all of those things are uh, going to be updated to the market in due course. What we're not going to do is lay out a detailed schedule that shows uh, that has to be updated almost weekly because I can tell you, and, and I, I would expect that most of the listeners would understand this too, um, depending on which week we're talking about, you know, we're ahead of schedule on two or three things and all of a sudden we're behind schedule on one or two. That's going to be natural and normal that one can expect. I can tell everyone that with the number of major vendors that we're involved with, these are massive uh, companies that we're involved with, like suppliers of the major equipment that we're talking about, uh, involved with power engineers, Akira, uh, Interflex, and the like. Uh, we're dealing with the major utilities for the interconnection, the gas companies with the gas, gas supply. Um, we are still on track to get things done by the end of March, by the end of the first quarter of 2021, to reach full notice to proceed. To the extent that that's going to vary, we'll give we'll give the market uh, advice if we think it's going to vary and be a, a few weeks early, big deal. If it's going to be a few weeks later, big deal. But the bottom line is, I think everyone wants to see that we're going to achieve that, and right now we feel that we're on track to achieve that. Thanks, Ross. Uh, we've just had an interesting question come through. Um, to, it sort of follows on what you were talking about with the regulatory environment in Alberta. Do you feel that the changing administration in the US and aspirations for reducing carbon emissions creates a better regulatory environment in the US and then by extension globally? So I think it's a, a bit more uh, wide ranging question, if you like. Oh, yeah, there's no listen. Look, I mean, that's a macro trend. It's nice to talk about going after foreign markets, right? Uh, it's wonderful to talk about foreign markets that have got programs designed to reduce the carbon footprint of their economies and all the incentives. But at the end of the day, what, you know, where's, what's the real prize? The real prize are the North American markets and particularly American markets. So this news for us, uh, I would point out, is hugely beneficial for us in what we're doing in North America. I would point out, I think in fairness, in fairness, um, it's not necessarily good for the Alberta economy. The Alberta economy is still a major uh, 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 part of our, our economy. A large part of our economy is exporting fossil-based fuels and chemicals. That's a major part of our economy. But why that's a good opportunity for a company like Kalina is because those companies who are facing a debt possible downturn in their business are also facing more perilously, more perilously, a, a, uh, a, a movement to show that they are acting uh, responsibly and are taking steps to reduce the carbon footprint of their individual 
companies and their industries. And that we already are seeing and already know that re represents a great opportunity for waste heat to power broadly in the market of Alberta, not just the projects that we're talking about that we're going to own ourselves. Now the next question focuses on the caliber of the board. Uh, obviously, you've got people like Peter Littlewood, who is a, who is a, uh, worked with China Light and Power, a thirty-six billion dollar company. Uh, Jeffrey Myers, we've referenced already, is the senior operating partner of Stone Peak, an eighteen billion dollar New York based investment fund. A couple of questions here, Ross. How did you manage to attract people of this caliber to an ASX listed micro cap? And are you looking to maybe? Um, beef up the, the board with any additional board appointments? Well, let's answer your first question if we can. Um, I would say that the, the reason that I was able to attract these folks is probably the same reason I was attracted to it. Anybody who's been in the power business or even loosely associated with it for the last you know couple of decades has heard about the Kalina cycle at, power, at, at Pristine Power, where we were, we had a great company for about eight years. The, the technology of choice was in fact the Kalina cycle that we were going to use for waste heat to power projects. What we ended up doing is we ended up using ORMAP because just our inability to negotiate an effective deal and have the right information available, the right engineering package available for the Kalina cycle. That's exactly what we're addressing today. As I mentioned earlier, customers do not want to find out they have to do all the engineering and figure it all out. They want a solution, a package. Thank you very much. How much does that cost? Great. Deliver it next year, whatever it's going to be. That's what they're looking for. So when I was asked or, or, or the, attempt, the opportunity was drawn to my attention and I was asked to take a look at it, I mean, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think I worked for about six to nine months on this thing without getting paid anything because I was really keen to see if this could actually take off and be and, and, and was viable. Because obviously the question was, why hadn't it worked until now? And so once I got involved, former team members from Pristine Power, including Jeffrey Myers, contacted me and said, hey, I hear you're working with the Kalina Cycle. Remember, we were looking at the Kalina Cycle. What's, what's, what's happening with that? And I said, well, we're, you know, Tim and I are trying to sort this out. Well, Tim Horgan and myself are trying to sort this out. We're bringing it through a restructuring here. Once we've got things sorted out, we'll be in touch. And that's what we did. And then Jeffrey Myers joined. And then from there, reached out with a phone call. I just, I heard that this guy was retired and I just wanted to try, and young guy's retired, but anyway, he's retired from China Light and Power. That's Peter Lidwood. I reached out and, and got in touch with him. And each guy that we've been in touch with, like Nigel Chea, who's president of, uh, was president of Maya Power and the uh, largest independent power producer in all of China uh, out of Hong Kong. Again, just a phone call. And then Ray McLean, who uh, was with NMAX uh, uh, out of Edmonton, same thing. Everyone, and this is the most important thing, every single person that's on our board of directors and every single member of our management team has been at some point in time in their career involved or knowing very much about the Kalina cycle. And so it doesn't take very much convincing from that perspective because they're all excited. They all wanted to know that we had a board and a management team that was committed to trying to go after this and do the projects properly and, and do the commercialization of the technology properly. And we were all struggling for the right business model until we realized it was right staring us right in the face. And that was, of course, the ORMAP model makes sense. What we did at Pristine Power made sense. Off balance, off balance sheet financing of our own projects. Let's just go do it and and get the ball rolling. And that's that's why they all came on board. The Kalina cycle has been deployed at various locations around to prove it can be a successful technology. However, none of the previous management teams built a successful business around this. What's different about the current Alberta strategy that gives you confidence in building a successful company? Hey, listen. You know, sometimes stories are, are are more exciting than the truth. I don't know if this is a true story or just or just a legend. I don't know, but according according to legend, Dr. Alex Kalina at first was was basically controlled his board of directors when he was involved with the business a long, long time ago. He was a very strong force, and he was so convinced, and he convinced everybody that they should never license the technology to anybody because the technology was so special they should own every project themselves 
and never licensed the technology to anyone. In the latter years, after years and years of failing to really get traction on that, they finally relented and ended up licensing it to Shinoda engineers out of Japan who built several projects quite well, and also Siemens out of Germany who built several successful projects quite well, but it was a little bit too late. And then when the technology was then taken over by uh, investors out of Australia, the, 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 everything changed. And it was, we'll never build our own projects, for heaven's sakes, we'll just, we'll never do that. We'll just license them because the technology is so fantastic. So they embarked on a licensing program that went on forever. At the end of the day, I think you have to have a balanced approach to this. But I think what everyone missed was, what does the customer want if you're licensing it? What the customer wants is a finished, completely engineered, solution that's all done, ready to go. They don't want to have to get involved and spend 18 months of their own time with their people doing it for you. That's the mistake that was made previously. And by the way, it's, it's not a mistake that I blame anybody on because I don't think anyone can be that critical. When you look backwards, it's easy to see what the corrections can be made. And even ourselves, when we started re redoing the model, we kept thinking it was going to likely be a licensing model until we realized, hey, the pursuit costs and everything else going associated with which market we're going to go after, et cetera, it's just too difficult. Why don't we just focus on a market we know we can get penetration in? Let's build our application for our technology going after that. Let's modularize it. Let's develop it. Let's just start to make some money for heaven's sakes. And with the foundation of making a profitable business, we'll, we'll then be able to go after all these different applications in all these different markets worldwide. Ross, your presentation makes reference to ORMAT technologies and the organic ranking cycle technology being the incumbent technology, if you like. Now, I can see the comparisons, but how are you going about replacing an entrenched and proven technology and convincing decision makers to change and take a bet on Kalina's technology? I think that's a great question. I think that's a really, really good question because because it really makes us focus on what we're doing. Okay, because Ormat is, I don't care, it's an impressive company. Uh, I can say how, I can tell you till the cows come home how how much better we believe our technology is than, than ORC. But we can't say that we're a better company than Ormat. Ormat has established themselves as an industry leader and they are a very, very impressive company. The thing that they did was they struggled for years, by the way. They struggled for years and years and years until they stumbled across the right business model for them. And the right business model for them was when they were approached by infrastructure funding out of New York that said, we don't want to take any investment in your company. We simply want to put our dollars at work in your projects. And so they began to fund ORMAT for their projects. Sound familiar? That's exactly what we're doing in Alberta. Exactly the same thing. And what, what ORMAT did was they said, well, Organic Rankin Cycle works on lots of different industries, cement, any place where there's waste heat power, but also works in, oh, and geothermal. So they decided to focus, their primary market was in geothermal. So they ended up using their newly applied build, own, and operate business model in one sector called geothermal, and within five years, they became you know, an overnight success, success story after 12 years of being in the wilderness. So here's what we're doing. We're going after a market in Alberta, which is Kalina cycles on the back of gas-fired turbines. That's going to be our identified market. And we're using our business model, which we used at Pristine Power and the ORMAT used. And that's what we're doing. I'm saying that I respect ORMAT. We all should. And we can also learn from ORMAT. Focus on a market that you know you can do well, that you know you can excel at, make sure it's properly funded, that infrastructure, non-dilutive, off-balance sheet financing can achieve, and that's exactly what we're doing. So following on from that, Ross, in your view, what's the key catalyst that you need here so you can say with absolute conviction that you know Kalina's on the on its way to being the next all that? Well, before I do that, I just realized I didn't answer one of your questions in the in the pre in the preceding question you just asked because you did ask about uh, 
convincing decision makers to change. I think that was an important part. And I think I missed um, emphasizing something if I could. I did mention the fact that Ormat began to focus in a market segment called geothermal, that they've continued to do that with their new business model. But I should tell you that if you look at their financial statement, I, I have, I'm have i not current on this current year, but if, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that they continue to show 80 or 85% of their revenues come from geothermal applications of their technology. So they've continued to focus there. The surprising thing to me, this is the surprising thing to me, the surprising thing to me has been that they have, while they've had some success, yes, in what we call industrial waste heat to power, like in a petrochemical plant or a power plant or a, a cement plant or a steel mill, they've had some success there. That has not yet reflect, been reflected in their, let's call it their, their market penetration yet. That represents a big, big opportunity for us. I think it's a little much to say we're going to be the next format because I don't think we deserve to say that yet. What I want to do is I want to make sure that we get the train out of the station, we build a successful company, we build on that success, and then we go after markets that format has not yet been successful in. So when we're talking about decision makers making decisions, they're not making decisions based upon ORMAT success in the petrochemical market or steel plants or uh, cement plants or any industrial facilities that have tremendous amounts of waste heat because they haven't established market dominance in those markets. We can go after those markets and we can get our share of the business. I'm convinced of that. So just on that, uh Ross, and just sort of change your tack a little bit, can you provide an update on your international licensing business plans, particularly with the Asian-based project team? I understand they've been on the ground for some time. When are we likely to see some progress there? You know, we're really lucky because the team that we have there, um, they're, they're, in fairness, they're all consultants and they're all doing their own thing on other projects, et cetera, unrelated to what we're doing. But they've also, interestingly enough, been helping us in our Alberta team uh, with some of the procurement of major vendors, et cetera. So they've been assisting what we're doing in Alberta, and that's how part of how we've been able to maintain their continuity with our business. They are all very much aware of exactly what we're doing, and that is to end up with cost-effective modularization and fabrication of the Kalina cycle with the work we're doing with Interflex, and either use Interflex modules and Interflex fabricated versions of the Kalina cycle, or replicate that in a similar fashion for the rest of Asia. And our key there is to make sure that we have a super handle on the economics. And this is very important for me to communicate one message I really want to get across to any of the listeners on this call. If you're asking, can I get a meeting with the biggest companies in the world in any sector? Yeah, I can get a meeting in a, in a week or two, maybe in a month or so. Can I do anything with that meeting? I know what I need to have that meeting result in something that can progress to the next step. And what we're doing in Alberta with Interflex and what we're doing with power engineers in that effort is exactly the information that we would need to have a meaningful outcome for any meeting that we would line up anywhere. And our team in Asia understands that. Uh, that's why we're all all of us are so dedicated on getting this work done. This is the first time in the company's history We've ever been able to get all of this engineering owned by us. In the past, when you were licensing, it was other people doing the engineering. We were advisors all the time. Now it's our engineering. We own it. We'll own the designs. We'll own all of this, and we can replicate modularized capabilities of the Kalina cycle in different industry sectors around the globe. So our team out of Asia is supporting what we're doing in Alberta, with the view of then taking that information and being able to go into other markets and have a meaningful outcome, as opposed to just protracted discussions and endless negotiations. And just finally, uh, Ross, uh, again, thanks very much for taking the time to take, take these questions. Where do you see Kalina Power in six months time? And where do you see him in two years time? I guess, what's your long-term vision for the company? And, uh, and how do you go about achieving that? Yeah, if I, I, I'm hoping that, that what I've been able to communicate on this call, I'm hoping that I've been able to communicate on this call is that none of us are here because we wanna build one or two projects in Alberta. Uh, none of us are here for that reason. 
we're not just here because we want to develop a few, even a handful of five or six. That's not why we're here. We're here to find a way to liberate the value of this technology to go after international markets and become a world player in the growing waste heat to power market. And while it's so tempting to get me, you know, by the way, these days you can't travel, so that's, that's I suppose, easy enough. But it's so tempting to be able to go after these markets, I'll call it prematurely, chase other opportunities, et cetera. We have a duty to the shareholders and investors who have given us the money to pursue these opportunities in Alberta and for us to go out there and deliver on that. And that's what our sole focus is right now. In, in the knowledge that if we do that effectively, we are then in a position to go after those bigger markets by establishing that economic and financial foundation that we that we that we so desperately need to do. So while it's tempting for me to talk about where we're going to be in two and three years, I really want to convey uh, we're going to go after that, but we're not going to get off track with our focus of developing a successful business, and that starts with us reaching full notice to proceed and moving forward with our initial projects. Thanks, Ross. Look, everyone, that's all the time we have today. Thank you all for joining me. And I'd also like to thank Ross for presenting and uh, taking the time to answer some questions. As I mentioned before, a recording of the webinar will be on Kalina's website later today. But before I let you go, Ross, do you have any closing comments? I sure do. I, I just uh, would like to say thank you very much for uh, for all the uh, attendees that took the time to I know everyone's busy with every all the other deals that they're working on, all their various investments that they're they're looking at, and uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the opportunity to reach out to all of you and answer hopefully some of your questions appropriately. And if you have more questions, uh, feel free, of course, to direct them through to the company with uh, Tim or myself, um, and we'll look forward to trying to do this again. Alex, I thought this is a really great venue, a great opportunity for us to work with you, and uh, this seems to be a very effective. Uh, effective tool uh, to communicate with our shareholders. And I think maybe we should be doing this a little more frequently because it seems, uh, well, I guess I guess the results will show if our, if our investors liked it and if it was successful, then let's look forward to doing it again. Great to hear it, Ross. Thanks everyone. Have a great day and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll chat again soon. Thank you very much. Cheers.